My name is Brian Wish. I'm an entrepreneur, CEO, and Pathfinder. If I've learned anything in life, it's that self-discovery is a critical part of living intentionally, building meaningful relationships, and achieving the future we see for ourselves. In July of 2021, I sold all my possessions, headed west, and began a quest to live a fuller and more meaningful life. The experience helped me truly understand the power of a single moment. And through my conversations with leaders from all walks of life, I've seen how that one phone call, heartbreak, diagnosis, or lost job can transform the entire course of our lives. In this podcast, I sit down with entrepreneurs, influencers, and experts across industries to talk through the events that changed everything. Together, we'll relive the make or break decisions, hard conversations, periods of despair and hope, chance encounters, and everything that followed. Bob Gower is a New York-based author, speaker, and consultant who cares deeply about creating organizations that are a net positive for the world. His mission is simple to help leaders align their teams on all levels so they can perform at their best. Bob is the author of two books, Agile Business, A Leader's Guide to Harnessing Complexity, and Radical Alignment, How to Have Game-Changing Conversations to Transform Your Business and Life. Along with his books, Bob has also contributed to the Huffington Post and Inc. Magazine. Bob has keynoted gatherings on four continents, as well as lectured at Columbia University, New York Stern School of Management, the Berlin School, and many more. He's worked directly with leaders at organizations from multinationals like Ericsson, Ford, and GE to nonprofits like New York Public Radio and Wikimedia Foundation to innovative new companies like Spotify and General Assembly, as well as many numerous startups. Bob, welcome to the One Away Show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. It's great to have you here. So, Bob, we've uh, gotten to know you quite well uh, the last Two, two, three years now. Uh, yeah. So I've been I'm looking forward to this conversation and maybe the alleyways we might go down. What is the one away moment that you want to share with us today? Yeah. So um, it's funny. I'm trying to boil it down to like a single moment because it was a, it was kind of a long experience. But I would say, actually, I'm going to go a little. I'm going to go a little bit. How to put it? Um, difficult, right? So there was a moment. I was in a cult for two years and, uh, and I went into the cult feeling, you know, upset, sad. I was struggling financially. I was struggling emotionally. And when I left, all of those things had been turned up to 11, right? So I was struggling much more financially, much more emotionally. Hmm. And I had a very, um, tough night. So when you say one away moment, I kind of want to pull it down to this moment. And there was this night I remember it very well. I was lying on a air mattress in a sort of a not so nice apartment in San Francisco and San Francisco's mission district. And I decided to give myself, you know, another few years to figure out if I could, I was like, I, th- I feel like I have some raw materials to make life a, a life that's worth living. I don't have a life now that I want at all. And I was very aware that like, I have made this, this is, this is the result of many of the choices that I've made in life and result of other things that were outside of my control, but obviously also the result of a lot of my choices. And I decided that I was like, I think I can, you know, like I've got some good, good resources here. They don't feel good to me now, but I've got friends who love me. I had an education. Um, I didn't really have much money, but I had, you know, I knew I could get backing if I, if I, if I asked for it. And I was like, I want to see if I can take these ingredients and put them together into something that I want, because right now I have not been so, so far I have not been successful in doing that. Hmm. And so I would say it was sort of like that moment of like lying on this, <laughs> this air mattress in this, um, you know, kind of drafty, you know, damp apartment in, in San Francisco, um, in the, in the, in the winter of San Francisco, in with San Francisco winter, which is kind of a grim gray experience as you're, you might experience soon because you're, because <laughs> you're, you're there now. Um, so I would say that was really the moment. Yeah. Mm. So in that dreary night and you're laying on the air mattress, were you still in the cult? No. So I had, well, it's a, it's a tough question, right? Um, in some ways to answer cleanly, uh, because nobody, People don't join cults. They join things that they think are good, and then those things turned out to turn out to be manipulative and bad, or mm. bad for them. 
And so I didn't know I was in a cult. I had not, I didn't have the language. I, it was going to be two or three years before I actually had the language to describe my experience as a cult experience. But I was no, and I, and I didn't even know if I didn't have any, I had moved out of the group's sort of co-living situation, but I hadn't officially, there's no, there, I had like, you know, there's no card you have to turn in, right? You know, like, you know what I mean? Like I was still affiliated with the group in some way. And I was still trying to struggle with like, are these my friends? Are they, is this my community? It's not my job, but what is it? And mm. so I, I hadn't quite made, I, I was clear I wasn't moving back in, but I hadn't quite made that leap yet of like, I am not part of this group anymore. And this group was a cult. And I'd love to maybe crack open a few things if you're willing. Sure. Um, you said at the beginning of the call that what led you to the cult was he had some things upside down financially and maybe some other areas of your life. What was it going well, maybe before you entered and what, how did you end up finding this group that ended up being a cult? Yeah. So cults or let's call them manipulative groups, groups that, you know, recruit people under false pretenses, which is part of what makes a cult a cult. And there's, there's more things we can discuss. But one of the things they tend to look for is people who are in, who are situationally um, insecure, who, you know, sort of like, who are going through a life transition, a life change. That's when many people find themselves in cults. So cults recruit mm -hmm. in college campuses often because people are away from home for the first time. They also, um, anyway, they just recruit people who seem vulnerable. So I had gone through a divorce and I was grad and I was just graduating from graduate school. I was also old, you know, I was an older grad student, so I wasn't like just the, the, the perfect age. How old? How old do we know? Uh, I was in my late thirties. Okay. And, uh, and so like, I think that I had this sense that life had passed me by. I was going through a divorce. It was not my first divorce. So it was sort of like, Oh, this is a pattern. What am I doing? And then I was also struggling financially but also, I think there's this other component, um, which is really kind of funny, I guess, and, or ironic, I suppose, right? That cults tend to be mission-driven organizations. They tend to be organizations that have lofty missions for changing the world in some way. There are political cults, there are religious cults, there are spiritual cults, there are financial cults, like organized around real estate sometimes. There's a lot of different kinds of cults out there. Mine was kind of a spiritual one, and um, and it was the, the idea was that they were going to make the world a better place. And so I was longing for this kind of meaning for, in my life. And if you sort of think about Maslow's hierarchy, right? Like I was insecure financially, socially, I was a little unbalanced because I was leaving my marriage. And then also I had this like meaning gap at the sort of the top of the pyramid of the self-actualization gap. So I was sort of like vulnerable at all layers and they came in and they were like, we're going to give you meaning. We're going to give you an instant social group and you can also like live here. Right. And so, I mean, they also wanted me to pay rent. So it wasn't like purely like we're going to give you money, but they were sort of beginning to satisfy all of those things. And, the, and all of those things were highly attractive to me, especially like the social group and that sense of meaning were really, really attractive to me. Mm. So you were in transition from marriage. You're evaluating the gaps in your life, maybe looking for the things to fill those gaps. Yeah. How did you, were you, so what, what led you to finding this group? Is it something you sought out? It sounds like you said cults find you in vulnerable yeah. positions. What, what, how did you learn about it? Well, so another dynamic of group of cults is that they tend to have layers. Um, so, and, and the, there's the sort of like, uh, I don't know, like a Tootsie Pop, right? There's the, there's the culty center surrounded by the, the, the nice candy outside. Right. And so, um, they tend to run, often run workshops, uh, what's, what's called sort of like these kind of large group encounter groups or whatever, you know, like these self-help groups essentially. Right. And in my case, they were doing, they actually just offer, they were doing a blues dancing class. It wasn't something they did a lot ever, but they offered a, like a social dancing class. And I was like, Oh, I want to be social. You know, I want to go someplace where I can, you know, meet women because I was going through a divorce and I was feeling like I would like to meet, you know, somebody else potentially or others. And, um, I just wanted to socialize. I wanted to socialize. I didn't necessarily feel like going to bars. And so they put up this class and I went to that 
And then there were all of these people being very nice. So the next phase, or one thing that, that, that these groups do and, and manipulative people in general do, is they, it's called love bombing. Sometimes it's unconscious, sometimes it's conscious, but they like to tell you how wonderful you are immediately, like how amazing you are and how happy they are you're here. And, you know, you, you feel like, you know, and when you're in this needy place, this feels like this... Um, it's like nectar, right? It's like, oh my God, people are, people are approving of me and they want me around and I'm lonely and I'm, and I'm trying to, and I'm getting all this attention. And so they invited me back. And what this group ran was on every, I think it was Wednesday nights, maybe anyway, every Wednesday night, there was this open group for anybody who could come in from the outside. I think it cost like 10 bucks. So the, the price of entry was relatively cheap. And they did a lot of communication games where you would um, we were encouraged to be very vulnerable and very real, um, uh, to ask for what you wanted. And then of course they loved bomb you more while you were there. So I began going to these things every Wednesday night and it became very, very, very quickly the most important thing in my life. It was like the central, um, organizing principle, my social, I was the thing I looked forward to every week was going to this thing on Wednesday night. And then slowly they asked me for more. I was like, Oh, Hey, we're doing a construction project this weekend. And I used to be a carpenter. And they're like, would you come by and, and, and work on this? So, so I started like, started going by and I started like spending every spare minute there to the point where I moved in. Um, and even then I wasn't even aware I was joining a group. I thought I was just joining an unconventional living situation with a bunch of people who I happen to like. So. Wow. So when you say you moved in, yeah. Tell me more about that. What, what did, what did that mean? What happened once you moved in? Yeah. So they had a large, um, co-living situation in San Francisco. Um, it was rather unconventional in terms of, there was a, a distinct lack of privacy and a lot of people sharing a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, um, sh a lot of people sharing a little space, let's just say, right. So we were all kind of living on top of each other and, um, it had this very strong communal vibe to it. It had a very strong, um, let's call it, you know, typical sort of San Francisco hippie counterculture vibe to it in some ways, right? There was um, lots of talk about sex. It was drug free, so there wasn't, you know, much drug use or anything like that, but it was very, <laughs> I'm just gonna keep saying the word communal. Like, it's like you're, all of a sudden I was living with a whole bunch of people. And what was really fascinating to me about it was how natural it felt. And I was immediately, what immediately called to mind was, uh, the stories I'd read about the, the long houses of the Native Americans in, in sort of Pacific Northwest they would have these sort of long houses where everybody, at least in winter, would kind of come and, and live together. Mm. And I had read some some sort of anthropological accounts of that. And I was like, oh, that's what this was like. You know, like it's kind of normal to be around people all the time. Like people are people we like, other, you know, we like being around other people. Mm -hmm. And it was it was objectively very strange, but it felt very comforting and very normal to me. Um, and I, again, I thought I was paying rent to live in an unconventional, you know, living situation. I'd been living outside the city with my wife. I really wanted to get back to the city, back to my roots. I, I, I love San, I love, you know, urban living and I wanted to get back to, back to San Francisco. And so this was just sort of a cheap way to do it with a built-in friend group. Um, what I found though, once I got in there was they kept asking for more and more and more of my time. And it was like, oh, you should volunteer to help with this workshop that we're having this weekend, or you should volunteer to help build out this project, or you should volunteer to help build out this website. And so slowly, they just sort of started taking all of my time and all of my energy. And at the time, I had a job outside the organization. Um, and then it became very clear there was there became there started being a lot of social pressure to cut ties um, outside. But it was very, it was it was kind of gradual at gradual. first, honestly. Yeah. It didn't, it wasn't like if you move in, this is what we're going to ask you to do, which again is a nature of cultic groups is they don't really disclose what's expected of you before you move in. It's not like a clear contract. And then the cost of leaving becomes very high. They're like, well, you could leave, but you're going to lose all your friends. You're going to leave your, lose your place to live. You're going to lose, you know, your sense of meaning and sense of purpose. You're going to lose everything. And, and so they, they sort of like increase that, that, that sort of the unspoken and sometimes the spoken things around the cost of that. Hmm. Sounds intense. Like these, like you say, these grids, gradual shifts, but like before you knew it, it sounds like you were just fully immersed. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
the I, I really wish I could do a timeline. And I think also the way these experiences work sometimes is our memory. Well, human memory is we know is just faulty, mm. period. Right. We we invent things, we reinvent things. But like I don't know that I have a really strong memory of exactly what the timeline was. Uh but within a few months at least, I had given up outside employment. Um, mm-hmm. I was actually being paid by somebody in the, who was associated with the cult to do some work for the cult because I had some marketable skills. A lot of other people weren't quite so lucky. They were like living on credit or, or still, you know, doing, we had people who were doing like massage therapy and things like any kind of gig work outside the organization. But, you know, I, I, I did what they, what we do, what they call, I went all in, right. There was sort of like this line about like, you need to be all in you need to be the, if the more you commit the more you're going to get out of this you know mm-hmm. you're and there's a lot of personal development tropes you know being recited like things about you know your comfort you know to getting out of your comfort zone getting away from your personal preferences is where your spiritual growth is being of service is where your spiritual growth is but really there was just a lot about keeping us busy keeping us tired keeping us um, off balance as well. There was a lot of, um, so there was sexuality. So cults and groups like this tend to control sexuality in one of two ways. Either pairs are, and pairs are always discouraged because a pair, like if you fall in love with somebody, then that begins to threaten your primary relationship, which is supposed to be to the group. And so in our group, it was people sort of like changing partners a lot, sometimes being directed by the leader to change partners. Hmm. And um, we, yeah. It, it was, it sounds very weird, I know, and I, I feel a little reluctant sometimes to talk about it, but like this was the, it felt normal to me, or it felt like, not normal, but it felt like valuable and expected, like, oh, because my, my dedication is to the group. But what they're doing is they're keeping you off balance emotionally as well. So there was jealousy, um, a lot of, you know, sense of like, fear often that something's going to be taken away from you at any moment. Like if you start to really like somebody, you're like, well, I can't really show that too much because then they'll discourage me to be with that person. Mm -hmm. And so you, you start. And what's interesting about cultic groups, I actually heard a a great conversation about this the other day is from a woman who she was in for a group like this for like 20 years, but she, and, and she had children inside the group. And, and it was my, my, my cult experience is like so mild compared to so many of the stories that I hear. But one of the things she said is that they end up keeping you isolated from every, from everybody within the group as well, like rather than being with each other. Cause if you have these internal doubts or these internal um, questions about the, the validity of the organization, You can't express those because those are frowned because doubts are frowned upon, right? Because if you're doubting, that means you're not all in. And if you're not all in, then that means you're not getting your, you're not spiritually enlightened and you're not working for everybody's liberation and you're not creating the the heaven on earth or whatever it is that we're trying to create. And so you begin to doubt yourself and you begin to doubt um, and you begin to feel very isolated inside of your own psychology. So my, um, my depression got much, much worse. My anxiety got much, much worse, but as it got worse, I was also simultaneously suppressing it all and keeping it all internally. So I had no outlet and no control for it. And so then that festers and it gets, and it gets worse and worse and worse. <sighs> Bob, <it was laughs> bad. this is kind of heavy, right? Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, you can describe Maslow's hierarchy. It's like, they almost have you trapped. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's no way out. The, what you shared about the, just sexual partners and kind of it's like you can't really build intimacy with one. So you need to like you build some 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 semblance of intimacy, then then no, you gotta like move on to the next, you know, type of thing for the yeah. betterment of the whole. Yeah. And then you've you've isolated yourself so far out of the normal realms of society. So it's like who do you go to when you struggle? Yeah. Um how long were you in the group? or the cult living there before it got really bad? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't think it was that long, you know? Um, So going back to the the sort of the, the, the induction process, let's say, and by the way, any listeners, if you're listening to yourself, like there are cults that are sort of everywhere right now, especially online. And a lot of the dynamics have changed because of online communication patterns, they no longer require often the single charismatic leader, which is sort of for these residential cults. We had a single charismatic leader and most groups tend to. Um, but so it goes, it switches very quickly. So it starts off with that love bombing. Like you're the best person in the world. Aren't you amazing? We love you. We're so grateful you're here. 
And then once they kind of have you hooked a little bit, once you start, begin to identify as a member of the group and you begin to like adopt that group as part of your identity, that all gets withdrawn. And then you end up, it's, it's, I think it would be maybe be analogous to a drug addiction almost. Um, yeah. I don't have much experience with anything like that, but like I've heard people talk about like chasing that, that first high, you, you know, like the addiction, like the first experience was so intense and so wonderful. And you're always trying to get back to that first experience and you're never able to. And that's why you remain addicted. That's why you remain trapped. And so for me, I was always like that love bombing was so uh, wonderful because I needed it so badly at that time. I was so insecure because of my divorce and, and other insecurities in my life. I needed that validation so much. Um, but as soon as I moved in, as soon as I kind of began to commit to the group, they began withdrawing all of that approval. And so, and as a matter of fact, most of the time I was met with disapproval, which is, it's kind of a weird, mm. it's a little, it's subtle and it's hard to think about, but, or it's hard to, hard to describe in some ways, but what we're, what we know from, from the, the, the research around cults is like people tend, we tend to keep ourselves in because the cost of exit is what becomes high. It's not the attraction of being in, it's not, that, it's not that being in is so good. Is it is it leaving is so is so it feels is is so dangerous, and that happens in a few ways. One, there's financial dependence. Two, there's emotional dependence and th dependence. And three, sometimes there's actual. I mean, in my group there was not, but some groups will threaten you with violence or threaten people you love with violence. Like this happens in cultic dynamics, but often it's usually it's much more subtle. But there's also this: um, anybody who left got talked about in really bad terms. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, um, so you're like, well, I don't want my friends to talk about me like that. So I'm going to make the decision to stay in and I'm going to make the decision to be good based on what, and maybe I can get back to that place where they really love me again. So I was fortunate. I was only in for two years and through a sort of series of happy accidents, um, I managed to kind of get out, which is how a lot of people end up getting out of cults. But like, yeah. so two, two, so I guess it was, I guess it got bad probably almost immediately. I guess that's a very long way of saying that. Like wow. it got bad, like it, like the love bombing stopped, right? Like, like, Oh, you're in great. Get to work, you know, shut up. And, uh, and, and, uh, you're not doing it right. You're not good enough. You know? So, the, so the shame, be, the shame starts. Yeah. The situation, yeah. Yeah, it's like what you came in with only perpetuated. What, Bob, and thanks for just the, the vulnerability here. I know this is so close to home and has just defined, you know, not defined you, but giving you a lot of meaning to your work today, which we can get to. Yeah. Um, so you said it got bad immediately. Like, when did you know it was time to go and how did, how did you get out? Um, the answer is I didn't know it was time to go and I only got out accidentally. Um, so, uh, one of the things that happens inside of organizations like this, another sort of common, it's a phrase in the literature around cults is they, they call it rapidly shifting reality. So you can never like be secure in your position. So if you have a position of authority, that position may be taken away at any time. And so inside this organization, people were always being hired, always being fired, always being moved around, always being, you know, oh, you should go to this city and do that. You should do this. You should be with this person. You should be in this role. No, no, you're not doing that role right. You should be in this role. No, you shouldn't be in any role. You know, like, so it's this always this sort of change. And for me, uh, there was a moment and it was one of many, but I lost my position. I lost my position of authority. I had no role. I had been like marketing director or something. And I, and I lost that, that, that job. And then at the same time, um, we actually had a bed bug infestation in our residence, which if anybody's ever lived through that, they're horrific. Um, it's very hard to get rid of bed bugs. It's, it's hugely disruptive. And you can imagine in a group sit living situation, how, how much harder it is. And we were quite diligent about it, but we just kind of, it was really, really hard to get rid of them. And also at that time I had been, um, I was in love, frankly, I had met somebody, she's still actually a very close friend of mine and somebody who I, uh, I considered my girlfriend and somebody who I, I really cared about. And she had this reaction to bed bugs where she was like, um, she just really didn't like bugs. <laughs> so she's like, we got to get out of here. So all of those things combined to get me out of the residential living situation for a month. And we rented a room 
And then I was like, while we were renting, while we were renting that room, I was like, well, wait a minute, maybe I don't want to go back. And our relationship was, we realized we weren't probably going to stay together, you know, as, as a couple, but we were still friendly. Um, it, it was rocky, but it was tough. But, uh, but, and then I also started going to 12 step meetings. Somebody just sort of like started taking me to these 12, to, to, to uh, a group called Al-Anon, which is um, support for people who are friends and family of people of addicts. And I realized like I have some alcoholism in my family. And so I was getting support. So all of a sudden I had this like outside support. I was living outside of the organization and I started looking for work. I was like, I need a job. So I started looking for work. I started looking for something else to do. And so it was sort of that cascade. Um, and then, so you asked, and so right about that time is when this, this moment of this night on the, on the, the air mattress happened. And I was like, I need to do something else. I need to do something else with my life. I need to turn my life around. I need to like find a job. I need to kind of get some money. I need to, you know, like, and so I started to being, I started taking care of myself. I started showing like care towards myself. And so I would say that just like it was fast to fall into the group for me, it was fast to fall out of the group. I, I was probably you know, within a week of moving out, I was like, okay, I'm never going back in, you know, like that phase of my life is over. And I thought it was just like, again, at the time, I didn't understand course of control. I didn't understand cultic dynamics, but I was just like, oh, I'm out, you know, like that's, I'm just not going to move back into that living situation anymore, but I might still help that group with its, uh, <laughs> with its plans, you know, with its, with its, uh, with its website or something like that. So, but I was also unaware at the time that that they needed me to be in in order to be involved, right? And so, the, and so around that time as well, the leader was like, you know, I can't help you if you're not living here, and and I was like, oh, okay, fine. You know, like she had lost her her hold on me as well at the time too. So, wow, yeah. When you look back on this experience, those two years, you know, clearly taught you a lot about yourself. It clearly kind of shook you in, in all the ways perhaps showed you how to put yourself first or love yourself a little bit by what you alluded to. But when you look back on, on this experience, what are some of the things that you're most grateful for out of it? Like what, if, if you didn't have that, how, you know, what, where do you draw appreciation or light from maybe those really tough two years? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the first and the easiest answer is probably that, um, and you'll hear this, I think, um, in 12 step meetings, I've heard this a lot as well. From, you know, I've spent a lot of time with people in the addiction recovery space over the course of the last several years, past, you know, decade or so. And one of the things you hear about is people are, are very grateful for what they call it their bottom, right? And so it's like sort of that place where they bottomed out. And because the bottom, if you survive it, and some people don't, but if the bottom, if you survive it, is the place where you decide to turn your life around, right? It's the, it's the place where you sort of like take some degree of control. And so what the cultic experience sort of did for me was I had always had, let's say, some issues around um, relationships with women, um, you know, feeling insecure there or feeling like, I mean, I, I could go on and on about what those, what those issues are. I'd also had... Um, issues around money and a sense of belonging. And, you know, like there were a lot of different things and being in the cult sort of like it played all of them out to their natural conclusion, which was bad. And so I was able to kind of see that like, Oh, the way I've been approaching my life, you know, like that, the, you know, the common denominator to all of these things is me. I need to make some changes. I need to approach my life differently. I need to take some responsibility and not look for the answers outside of myself, but look for the answers I feel like I'm sounding like a cliche now, but I need to look for the answers inside myself or through my own actions and through my own. Um, it also allowed me to see that uh, my perceptions of the world were not accurate. Sometimes I was really struck by like, oh, I was being I, I, I was either being deceived or being self-deceptive at the time. And so that led me towards cognitive behavioral therapy and EMDR, which are two forms of therapy, which have been very, very helpful to me in terms of changing behavior, changing sort of default cognitive states, mm. my, my mood stabilized and a lot of, you know, a lot of, other, I also got sober. I, I stopped um, drinking altogether or, or using any, any mind altering substance besides coffee, which is still my favorite, but, um, um, and actually I do drink alcohol now as well. I've kind of gone back to where I, I feel like I can reincorporated into my life. But for three years afterwards, I was completely sober. 
went to meetings all the time. I, and I, and I also, you know, got, got into therapy. So not, I don't know if any of that would have happened without me being, a, having been a part of this group. But I also think there's another question you're asking, which is a little subtler and a little more interesting, which is what was good about the group, right? In some ways, right? Like what was, what was, you know, what were the potential positive? Because again, people don't join cults. People join things that are good, that are, that kind of turn bad. And what's fascinating to me about this time in the cult is that many of the tools that I learned in there, sort of the, there were some meditation tools we had, there were some um, personal reflection tools. Uh, many of them are, I still find kind of valuable, right? That they, that, that there were, that there were things that helped me. And you'll hear like, I'm, re I'm reminded of Tom Cruise talking about Scientology and his dyslexia, right? I have a dyslexic son and, you know, like I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of the struggles around this. And like, he's like, Scientology had technology that helped me deal with my dyslexia. And I actually have no doubt that he's accurate about that, 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 that he did find something there that did really help him. Um, I should be maybe very careful about what I'm calling Scientology now, because they're, they're <laughs> notorious. They just, I am not saying Scientology is a cult. Um, but uh, I am saying that it's, it seems to be a less positive organization for a lot of the people who are involved in it. That does not mean that it doesn't have positive tools. It does not mean that it doesn't have good things about it. And I think that's one of the harder things, frankly, for people when they leave organizations. I still have friends who left this, this organization who do not interpret it in the same way that I interpret it as a cult, or they, they're, or perhaps they're a little more forgiving or a little more um, uh, generous, I would say. Uh, and I think it's because they're having, they, they, because they actually got a lot out of the experience. They actually, they had, you know, I, they, they were, I had great friends in there. I, I mean, my best friend is still a man I met while I was part of that group. I'm close friends still with a few of the people who left it. Uh, I felt secure in a way and loved in a way that I don't think I'd ever felt before. I remember like feeling like this, like these amazing, this amazing sense of bonding with a group of people, which has not always been easy for me. Um, and we were also able to do when we needed to focus energy as a group, we were really good at it. Like if we wanted to create an experience for somebody or, or if we were being directed to, um, just to clean up the kitchen or whatever, right? Like we were on it, man. And, and it felt really good to be like part of a team that's like on it and working really well together, being in flow with each other, something really beautiful about it. Um, and yet the end result was the thing we were working towards and, and some of the things we were doing were, were not so great. Let's just say so. Well, I appreciate you sharing, you know, because I think when you look at something for the positives or the healing element to that, but you can also objectively look at it and you can, you can see the things that weren't so good. Yeah. You can pull those away to make the change. And what I'm hearing you saying, what I will definitely want to get to in a minute, I have a couple more questions is you saw a cult as a functioning organization yeah. with a lot of dysfunction, but maybe parts of an organization that were good and, un and understanding those underpinnings of behavior. Yeah. Um, and so I appreciate the lens, um, I know it's been some time since you've been out, but the fact that you've been able to, I think from the outside looking in or me knowing you take a lot of healthy steps forward. So um, before we get there, yeah. just one more question. When, when you came in and, and if you don't want to answer this, that's okay. When you came out of the cult, did you feel like you had to explain to people like, Oh, that you, who knew you like about your experience or like where you fear acceptance, your family, past partners, like I, like, what was that like? Yeah. I mean, there's still people who I have not been able to have that conversation with, you know, like with my family, I, I've never been particularly close with my family, but, um, at least not since, you know, since I left home as a teenager, but they, they're, you know, I'm still, I still see them for holidays and things and we don't talk about it, right? Like there's just not a conversation, you know, I feel like they're aware of my involvement. They're probably aware of a bit about the organization. It, the organization did get written up in the press. They did read it. I know at time, you know, so I don't know what they know. I don't know what they don't know because we just never talk about it. And there was also a lot of like negotiation I had to do with other, not negotiation, but there was like emotional negotiation in some ways with people who were still sort of half in or people who were leaving at the time. Cause this is my whole social group for two years mm -hmm. and it became like, they, it became my friend group. And again, I'm still close with people who were in the group 
And some of us interpret our experiences very differently. And so it's, it, it became this kind of thing where, and again, I didn't, it took me two years to even learn the word cult and learn that it had a definition and learn that people had written about the experience I had. I opened a book by John Jalalich called Take Back Your Life, which is the best book on this topic, in my opinion. And I was like, oh my God, I thought I had this unique experience, but no, 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 everybody, you know, so many people have had the same experience, right? Like, and so I was just like reading this book and I was like, light bulbs going off all over the place, but other people either never, never read the book or never had that experience. And so we had to like, I still had to like figure out whether I wanted to keep them in my life or not. And so there was that negotiation. And then the third big negotiation was with like LinkedIn, right? Like it was like with my resume was I had this like weird gap. Um, and mm -hmm. some people resolved it by listening, listing this organization as their employer. I know. And I'm like, but I don't want to list this or this organization's a cult. I don't want to like list it as my employer, even though it has a legitimate face at times. Like I still don't want to, be, I don't want to be associated with it. And so that was, I, I had a hard time. I think I described it sometimes to people as a sabbatical, you know, like, oh, I took two years to find myself after graduate school. I took two years to find myself, you know, and that somehow seemed a little more acceptable than, than I was part of this like sketchy organization that I don't want to talk about. Um, that, that, you know, talked about sex too much, you know, like it just got, it was just too weird and I didn't want to. And so like negotiating with call it, let's call it the straight business world was, uh, yeah. was, was kind of a, a hard bit there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bob, talk to me. A, so one that like, makes total sense on like your family and I feel like for another conversation for another time, we could get into all the things in the family that maybe led yeah. to the dysfunction to, you know, take, make those certain decisions, but let's, let's yeah. one of the things I'm curious about, and this is a nice segue into where I want to go with the future questions is you went through this two year, crazy two year period. Then you sounds like you went through this like reckoning of this is not the direction for my life. And then you had to like what you kind of talked about and go get a job, do all these things. It's like this reintegration period back into like, I should say society. Um, I, I've almost felt like that this year, uh, you know, giving from January onwards, like six months in silence and then six months in like trying to figure out this new skin. And my question for you is like, after you develop this sense of, Hey, I got to move forth with my life, turn the page on this chapter. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you to like reintegrate and like, how, how did you even think about going about that and the steps to take? And like, I just have to imagine that must've been so difficult and hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was not easy. That's for sure. I mean, I also had uh, you know, graduate school debt. I had credit card debt because I'd been living, you know, like I had a lot of like things hanging over me, thought about declaring bankruptcy a couple of times and, and a few other things as I left. So what's it, what was interesting, I think about the time of, of the reintegration time was, one, things were very immediate. Like I was like, I need to earn money and I need to find a career. And again, kind of going back, I, I often look at things through the lens of Maslow's hierarchy of, you know, essentially like biological and safety needs at the bottom, social needs in the middle and meaning or self-actualization needs at the top. And you have to take care of the base before you can get to the top. But I've also been always been somebody who needs to find a lot of meaning out of their life and a lot of meaning out of their work. It's one of the things, reasons that I would think I was a good target for a cult that was trying to make the world a better place. I was like, we'll give you meaning and we'll give you something to do and we'll give you a social group. I was like, oh, great. Sign me up. So as I left, and by the way, I'm very, I feel also very fortunate because there's a common phenomenon called cult hopping. People often will leave one high intensity yeah. or high demand group and find themselves immediately in another one. They're like, oh, I want the high demand. It was just, it wasn't this one. It was this one over here. And so you'll find that and that's a common phenomenon. I was fortunate. I didn't find that. I was, I, I was kind of done, um, on a variety of levels. So, um, so I, you know, I, I got a job and I, and I, and I had been, before I went in, I had been working in a, in a dying industry. <laughs> I'd been working in print design for newspapers. Um, and this was, uh, kind of early two thousands when I was, when I was going through all of this. And, uh, that was a time that was a rough time for the newspaper industry. And so it was like there, there, there were no jobs and, and what jobs there were, were, were much poorly paid than had been. 
Um, I'd done some web work as well. And so I, I had these like skills, but I did a little bit of soul searching about what I wanted to work on. I also had a, a graduate degree at this point. And so, and it's been a journey. And I mean, you've been a part of this journey for the, you know, as I've been, you know, kind of getting to know you and working with you some for the past uh, couple of years, past little while here, like trying to find a way to um, do something that I believe makes a difference, a positive difference in the world. You know, as I get older, I always think about that phrase of, you know, like, you know, old, older people, we, we plant trees that, uh, whose shade we will never know, which is a very poetic way of saying it. basically like, like your, your days are numbered and, you know, you're not gonna, you know, you're going to build stuff that you might not necessarily get to enjoy yourself, but you find meaning because you're leaving it for other people. It becomes that, that sort of sense of service or that sense of, of, uh, of, of, um, providing something somebody else for family or for, or for future generations or whatever. So I myself kind of motivated around a lot, a, a lot around that, but then you also have to pull back and be able to also satisfy your, your basic needs. You have to be able to make a living. You can't, you know, like, and you have to be pragmatic and also aspirational. And so I find that that's the negotiation I'm often, in. I find it much easier to be aspirational than to be pragmatic. Um, and that's just sort of like it's, and so I got a job for a while uh, and that job was very helpful. It paid my bills. It helped me build up some skills and build up a professional network. And I just could not I had to think about making money for a little bit. And that was very helpful. It also allowed me to pay off all my debt and it allowed me to build up a little capital. And then for the, about the past five years, I've been experimenting more with like doing things and building things on my own and, and going and, and going out on my own. I don't know if I'm exactly answering your question. So feel free. No, to like, no, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so one, I, I, I just want to say, I think, I think it takes a lot of courage and, and bravery to just, you know, take those steps right forward. And it seems like you, you took some things head on, uh, you addressed some root triggers, got some therapy and a lot of therapy and, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and, and I've kind of worked to reconstruct your life from, you know, the ashes per se, you know, out of yeah. the, you know, the bottom something, Bob, that, especially has come out recently and when we've been having chats and, you know, even when we first started talking, but I think it's more in front of me now and excited about what I think what we can do with it. But mm -hmm. you, you have such an interesting perspective on organizational change and organizational yeah. development uh, because of this experience yeah. and have been doing a lot of work today um, to help organizations. Can you maybe describe, um, what you're doing, how perhaps the coal is influencing the way you're going about helping organizations and what you see for the future with your work. Sure. That's a loaded question. So feel yeah. free to break, break it apart one by one or. Yeah. Yeah. Segments. I appreciate that. I'm going to start kind of the macro and get down to the micro, right? Like it's right. sort of what Perfect. I do. And so, and so the macro, and so by the way, my graduate degree is in sustainable systems. So I started looking at, we were looking at how to build organizations that, and sustainable management, like how do we build organizations that are good on a people, planet, and profit perspective, right? Organizations that exist inside of a capitalist system use, um, and but use that capital in order to solve various social and environmental problems for, you know, or at least not create negative externalities, right? So that was sort of where I, I started. And as I went through that work, one of the things, and also I, I think there's sort of like two threads, two intellectual threads that I'm, that I keep tugging on intellectual thread. Number one is like, well, how do you really create sy systemic change, right? Changing a system is not easy. Anybody who's trying to change a system, you know, has, has experienced this even, I mean, I've worked with CEOs of some very big companies in recent years and ev they can't even change their own system, right? Like even though they have theoretically full control, it's very hard to change a group of people. And one of the natures, one of the things about um, systems is that they are, I'm going to use some technical terms here, but deterministic, but unpredictable. So on the one hand, they are built based on what happens before matters, right? So what you do now creates the future. So they're deterministic. We do something and it changes things in the future. The other thing is they're unpredictable. And if you if you've read up on like the butterfly effect, right, that the flapping of a butterfly's wings in one hemisphere can theoretically 
cause a hurricane in another hemisphere, that little tiny things can add up to these great big things, and we don't know what they're going to be. They're unpredictable what's going to happen. So this little thing happens, and this big thing is the result of that, but we don't know what we're going to, what's going to happen. And so this is something I've struggled with my whole life. I'm like, how can I live in a world where I know what I do matters, but I don't know <laughs> like what's going to, I don't know what it's going to create. And the other thread I, I've been pulling on quite a bit is, like I've worked, every organization I've ever worked in has kind of sucked, right? Like it's like work has been kind of hard and there's been bad, I've worked for a lot of like bad managers and a lot of like places where I'm just like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be a part of this particular community of people doing this particular thing. People are yelling at each other. I don't like this. I don't have enough resources. I don't have a, like all of the complaints If anybody who's worked, many of us who've worked jobs, right? We all kind of like know that like jobs can sometimes be terrible with many of, hopefully people are, I think better, organ, good organizations are becoming more commonplace now. So hopefully your listeners have maybe a different experience. But what I've realized with those two threads is that what I really care about and what I think I want to work on, what I think matters is um, creating better organizations, creating organizations that are a net positive for the world, creating organizations that, that do good in the world, but also organizations that treat individuals inside the organization with care, with respect, and with humanity, and really honor individuality and honor, frankly, diversity, and like are, be, are equitable, are sustainable, and are profitable. And I think because we you know, we're in a capitalist economy for the foreseeable future. And we have to like, we have to make sure that happens as well. And so the, the thing that I've settled on, the small thing that I've settled on where I think I can have a big impact um, while at the same time, not create a lot of unintended negative consequences um, uh, in this sort of systemic way is by focusing on team leadership. Because I think teams People don't quit their job; they quit their boss, right? The, like the, the if you don't like your job, it probably means you don't like the five people that you work with, or you don't like your boss, or you don't like you know you don't like this immediate. It's not like you don't like the CEO because you never see the CEO. You're far, you're so far away from that person that so company culture is often defined by the people that we're spending most of our time with, and those people are on teams. Hmm. And so the work that I do focuses in two places. One, I like to work with senior leadership teams because I feel like they set the interaction and behavioral patterns for the rest of the organization. They design the rest of the organization. They design the superstructure. So, and they make it safe for teamwork. So if you have a dysfunctional leadership team, it's very hard to have a functional organization, Like you need that functional senior leadership team. And then the other thing I'd like to focus on, or I spend a lot of time focusing on is creating a cohort of really high quality team leaders inside of organizations, because I think these team leaders are the people who make the biggest difference inside the org. Because you can say, we need more teamwork here. Well, what the hell does that mean? If you don't have people who don't have the skills, who don't have the capability, who don't have the mindset around creating good teams. So I have a course where I teach people how to how to lead teams and form teams better that are that mm -hmm. where people get treated with respect. And I also have a consulting and coaching practice where I work with senior leadership teams and organizations. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that I focus on. Yeah. Well, I really like how you think you've thought, first off, the butterfly effect, you know, whether the small or big short changes that create some of these seismic mm -hmm. shifts. Yeah. Um, and how does how how are those integrated into organizations? And then also what you said about if there's a functional the dysfunctional leadership team. It's very hard to have a functional organization. Yeah. And so working with leadership to create better function for you, Bob, um, which which I just think is fascinating um, going down this path after kind of what you saw. When you look at your work, how much of, of your teaching and your curriculum and uh, style and methodology is is gleaned from insights during being in the cult and you know obviously the future education that you've built since then. But like, what how much is derived from those experiences and brought into your work? Yeah, I would say a lot. And a lot of it is kind of subtle in some way. Not well, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it, there's a perspective because I think the biggest lesson I take away from the cult, at least I'm going to say the biggest lesson in this conversation, in another conversation, I might choose another big lesson, but biggest lesson I've, I've taken away from the cult experience is how people's enthusiasm and excitement and generosity and goodwill and kindness can be weaponized against them and can be weaponized in service of something really, really terrible. Hmm. And that, you know, 
we, we like to blame sort of bad things inside of organizations on like sociopaths and narcissists and, and, uh, and, and people who are Machiavellian and like, and that's true. There are people that we, there are individuals we have to watch out for, but these individuals, if they're smart and many, and most of them are, many of them are, will surround themselves with people who are unlike themselves, people who are slow to judge, people who are kind, people who are hardworking, people who are generous. And, and they manipulate these people emotionally. Often they lie, often they are deceptive. And so what I'm very, very sensitive to when I think about organizations and the organizations that I work with is this idea that we just need to inspire people and motivate them and make them feel good because that's exactly what these sort of darker, you know, folks, you know, people who are mm. with darker intentions, that's exactly what they're doing. It's an emotional manipulation and it's an emotional manipulation that I call it toxic charisma because it's an emotional manipulation. Charisma is a, to is a, is an emotional experience. If you, if you feel like someone's charismatic, you know, you're having an emotional reaction to that person. That's wonderful. I mean, I, I don't want to take that away from anybody. But what happens is, is people can weaponize that that charisma in order to constrain the more logical. Like so, like what happened with me in the cult was, I got very attracted to this group emotionally, and then my logical faculties or my my sort of my ability to kind of think my way through a problem became constrained inside the group. I was still a good worker inside the group. I still had all sorts of like logic and av available to me, but I couldn't see outside the group. I was in like the labyrinth, the monitor's labyrinth, right? You know, I was like in, stuck inside this thing that I couldn't see outside of. And so I become very, very sensitive when I talk about team leadership is I do not ever emphasize vision and motivation and charisma. I feel like those mm. things are kind of nice to haves, but they're as often counterproductive or dangerous as they are mm. valuable. And the, the, so the approach I take to team development is very nuts and bolts. You know, it's sort of like, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Do we care about it? How can we do it better? Are we all participating equally? Are we all sharing in the load? Um, how do we measure success? Um, how, you know, how do we share resources? Like, let's co-create this thing together rather than let's follow uh, uh, the leader. Let's, let, you know, and so when I, when I think about team leadership, that's what I think about. Wow. Yeah. Well, I love the shift. <laughs> I love the premise. I love what you stand for and just the authenticity to your work. You're not just some guy in a soapbox <laughs> saying leadership and organizational change should be this way. You know, you have, you have, world experience to draw on in a very tactical way. And I'm, I'm excited for you and what's ahead um, as I've gotten to know you and I'm, I'm just so grateful for a friendship. Bob, as we close out here, where can people find you? BobGower.com is the easy place to find everything about me. You can find my writings there. I've written a couple of books. The most recent one was with my wife. It's called Radical Alignment. It's about building better relationships, both at work and at home. Uh, and you can also find about my consulting work and upcoming projects and my classes. Everything is there. BobGower.com. It's very easy. Awesome. Thank you for joining me on The One Away Show. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, please leave a review and follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Have a One Away moment you'd like to share? Follow me on Twitter or Instagram at BrianWish underscore. Or reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me about the moment that altered your life. The One Away Show is produced by ArcBound, a company dedicated to helping entrepreneurs, experts, and visionaries launch authentic personal brands. From message development to podcast production, social media content generation, and book writing, we work with you to create your arc. Head to arcbound.com to learn more. Thank you for listening, and please join me next time on The One Away Show.